thank you so much, Jenny, uh, Jennifer Aitley, for joining us here all the way in, in New Zealand. It's the, the miracle of technology that we can... Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm through. I actually took a screenshot um, when your prime minister came online because I have some friends who are friend, uh, are big fans of her. And also, I think your health minister is, has, has, has quite a following. Um, and because I'm going to share it with some of my friends that, like, in, in an abstract way, you know, I was on a Zoom call with lots of, like, cool New Zealand people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, COVID celebrity <laughs> culture, right? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are hey, on it. Yeah. Hey, so absolutely loved the movie. I, I remember watching it when we were watching the screeners and mm -hmm. thought it would be perfect for the schools program, which I run, um, because one, young people, two, diversity, three, language. Um, you know, we're, we're very interested in uh, showing a, a broader world view at Dock Edge and, uh, and looking at inclusion. So we don't have this kind of, monocultural uh, perspective on, on the world. And you did such a fantastic job at, sh at representing now that we're in a, an international, internationalized global digital culture, how there's much more ability to participate. So I'm hoping you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, so not only am I the producer uh, or one of the producers of this documentary, I also co-founded an organization called Emoji Nation, uh, which advocates for more inclusive and representative emoji. The, you know, the motto um, is, you know, emoji by the people for the people. And it, it basically helps normal people, like as, as you can see from the documentary, anyone can propose an emoji. It helps them through like, like a, you know, a quasi bureaucratic system that is um, in some ways, and in, in terms of on behalf of Unicode, one of the most inclusive ways to lobby large technical organizations. So one of the things that we really care about you know, in terms of Emoji Nation, and any, anyone can join. I mean, you know, anyone who's out in the audience can Google Emoji Nation, like click on the link and join our Slack and like show up uh, to say if they want to do any, um, any you know, any emoji proposals that they, they feel very, very passionate about. And um, one of the things we want to do is fill in both the A cultural represented world and then also sort of the semantic gaps um, around the world so for example you know I, I still think we, there's a lot more that we can do in the Middle East there's a lot more we can do in Africa there's a lot more um, we can do in in parts of Latin America so that's everything from holidays that are really important uh, fruits and foods that are really important clothing musical instruments like for you know obvious reasons the first generation of emoji skewed Japanese in certain ways and then skewed also very U.S. American, like Western European centric, and one of the most important things is that you know the the planet is between seven and eight billion people, um, and there are a lot of things that they want to say that are not just sort of in the vocabulary of of Western countries or in, or or Japan, and um, you know, and and as you can see from the work that you know all the different groups did in advocating for emoji, they care they they care about. Um, it's very, you feel seen when you have an emoji that you care about because it represents you or your culture on the little screen. Like we know in many ways, you know, there's the whole, um, there are campaigns about representation on television or in movies, you know, sort of like the big screen. But in, in many ways, um, emojis or representation on a small screen is as important, if not more important, because it allows individuals to represent who they are. Absolutely, yeah. And um, on that topic is when you're talking talking about you know there's there's mainstream representation, mm -hmm. and then there's um, you know there there are groups out there like for instance I know that the there's been a bit of a push for different flags, particularly indigenous flags, to be re wow. represented. We we have uh, the Te Noranga Te Rotanga flag here and the Aboriginal um, you know sun the black and the yellow and the and the, yeah. and the red there. No, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is one of the more controversial or not controversial, but sort of um, actively debated issues within Unicode. So actually one of the most important things to note is that I'm in, it looks like there are lots and lots of emoji flags. Um, they're actually technically not individual characters. What happens is most of the flags are actually represented by the white flag. And then um, invisibly after it, it's often the, I think it's a two letter country code and when you know your op your your phone or your computer sees it, 
it sees a white flag, it sees a country code, it matches these things together, and then goes out and it, and it grabs the, um, you know, the, the flag that it associated with that. So in many ways, the Unicode system is dependent on the technical standards that come up with right. those regional codes. And you know, not only on a country level, but it can sometimes go on, um, on, a, on a lower than country level. So that's why you have Wales and Scotland and England represented, whereas you don't necessarily have those subregions represented for other countries, which is like another issue. But there are many, we've gotten many, many um, flag requests for regions that don't have those codes, you know, whether or not it's an indigenous flag or at least in the, in the United States, um, a lot of Native American cultures and um, representation don't have, um, you know, these these country codes. So it's been a it's been a real interesting debate, and it is it is sort of beyond at this point the scope of what, of what Unicode can can handle alone. It has to coordinate with a lot of other standards bodies. Um, but we are we we know a lot of people care. <laughs> We're yeah. very cognizant about that and are um, thinking hard about it. In, it's nothing interesting is going to happen in the short term, but we know a lot of the planet cares about seeing a, a range of flags that are not just um, nation states. Sure, I mean the 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 explosion of emoji it's it's been phenomenally popular, and I can imagine that perhaps the Unicode Technical Committee is is a small team and they're they're overwhelmed. Like I I tried getting in touch with with a representative there to to speak for the schools program. Um, oh, and, I and they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, hook me up, hook me up. Um, but but it, you know, there's there's a little, there's kind of a tinge in, in the movie that they are shadowy or secretive or or difficult to access. And and I'm wondering how much of that is is an attitude versus actually just being overwhelmed with how popular and how how many uh, groups out there want to have their their yeah. little slice of the world represented. Yeah, so I, I don't even know if this mentions in the documentary, um, but I'm, I'm actually one of the vice chairs of the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee. I don't know if we actually mentioned that, because I was trying to, I think if we wanted to make them seem a little bit more shadowy than they were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've been a member of uh, the Unicode Subcommittee for full, almost five years. Is this right? Where are we in June? So I joined in like late 2015, so four and a half years, if that, if that math is right. Um, and so there is the, the Unicode, there's a Unicode technical committee, which is a lot of, um, you know, older engineers who worked on some of these issues for a long time, plus a smattering of like younger engineers who care a lot about in, uh, internationalization. And then uh, as part of that, or adjacent to that, there is the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee. And that has like two parts. So one part is um, you know, representatives from the companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and probably some other companies in there. And then they're just actually like some normal people who really care uh, about emoji for other reasons. You know, I'm on it. Um, there's another person from Emoji Nation. There are two linguists which are on there, which have, which have kind of brought a really important uh, perspective. We like to bring designers on there. So on some level, someone is just really passionate about emoji and like is willing to put in the work. They can like, you know, get invited, you know, through some maybe secret selection process into the subcommittee and then become involved um, in that decision making or at least the deliberative process. In the end of the day, the large companies obviously still hold, you know, dramatic sway because it is often uh, the burdens on them to implement it into the phone. So they care about, you know, the, the larger messages of what that send, the, the technical burden on their engineers, sort of the how it impacts the user interface when you're inputting emoji. So they'll, there's oftentimes like a push and pull. Actually, one of the people on the committee is also the founder of Emojipedia, Jeremy Burge, who's just originally from your kind of area of the world. He's from Australia, though now he's in the UK. So they're just like some really normal, passionate people who show up <laughs> on the emoji subcommittee. And so in some ways, uh, Unicode seems kind of shadowy, uh, but compared to many of the things that technical and um, you know, technological companies do, in in some ways it is very accessible because you know anyone can join uh, for seventy five dollars as an individual. You don't have the big voting power, but you have the right to be on the mailing list and the right to go to the meetings. 
Um, you know, historically, one of the problems is that they had their meetings three times a year in Silicon Valley and one time a year up at Microsoft, and that obviously was a huge barrier to entry. With COVID, they have, you know, how to, they're going to do, they did last quarterly meeting online, like through Zoom, and they're going to do the next one um, online. And I think that actually makes it much more accessible for people who can't travel all the way to Silicon Valley. Sure. So, I mean, what, what interests me is like where, where their money actually comes from. Is there a certain component of, of state funding or private funding? Is it membership yeah. based? It's and, membership and, and how does that, how does that affect um, the, the decision making process, if you like? Yeah. So, um, most of the members, a full member of Unico pays, I think it's now 21,000. It used to be $18,000 a year for full voting rights. And then there's sort of tiers that go up, you know, between basically 2,500 and like, you know, up to the, up to, I guess now the 21,000 where you get half a voting right here and like, you know, no voting rights, but you get you have your logo or you get, you know, you get, to, you get the right to sit in. Um, and then that money, which is, uh, I'm sure I could pull the tax documents. I'm sure it's a couple, it's basically probably half, you know, uh, probably not quite half a million dollars, I'm gonna guess, somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark, um, goes to pay for, there are three part-time staff and a lot of the work is actually done on a volunteer basis because many of the people who work on um, Unicode issues come there for two reasons. Either it's officially their job, so you know whether or not they work at Microsoft or they work at um, Google, they are on the internationalization team or somehow involved in like, you know, characters. Or the other thing is they've just been involved with the organization for such a long time. And as they move from job to job, they, they still take an active role in, you know, deliberating and, and implementation and whatnot. So it's almost like an extracurricular for some of them. Um, and the, there's another fun project that I will, I will kind of give a plug for, which is that uh, there is an adopt a character program that Unicode oh. has. <laughs> where you can like pay anywhere between 100 US to, I think it goes up to 5,000 US to adopt a character. And you know, they'll, they'll do like a, a tweet and sometimes a press release on it. And that money actually is, goes to support the encoding of underrepresented and endangered and minority scripts. So, so these are languages that um, there is not enough of, of like a vendor, like the computer companies themselves or technology companies themselves are not motivated from a financial standpoint to encode. Um, and so instead this money kind of goes and supports um, scholars or other um, researchers who, who want to take languages that have not until this point been digitized and allows them to come up with a system and to and proposal to digitize something. So it's very interesting from an emoji standpoint versus like you know, existing languages is historically Unicode took existing languages. So it was already fixed and it, it just figured out, well, this language ex exists. So how do we turn it into something we can express in computer code? Uh, whereas with Emoji, we're kind of making it up as we go along, sort of. Um, you know, we do take some guidance, but this is a very controversial thing when Unicode decided to start encoding Emoji because for a lot of, you know, old schoolers, it felt like Unicode was going beyond the, the um, like perimeter of what it was supposed to do. That well, well, from from that very technical um, point of view, we're now going to shift to an audience question of um, <laughs> who adopted the smiling poo. Has anybody adopted the smiling poo? Yeah, lots of people yeah. did. did um, so it it's uh, you can adopt in different ways. So if you use a hundred hundred dollars. Uh, infinite number of people, this is a bronze level, anyone can adopt it. Like if you wanted to buy someone a, a Christmas present, you can um, you, you, you can do that and they'll get a little certificate. And then there's like, I think a thousand dollar level, which is silver and then a $5,000 level. On the $5,000 level, only one person can adopt a smiling poo. And I don't actually know that it has been uh, adopted on that level, the exclusive level. And then on the um, silver level, I think they're up, they're up to five people. Five what, entities. What do you now. get for that? What what what's the benefit of of adopting Poo? <laughs> the highest one, I think you get like like a. I haven't seen these. I think you get a statue. You get something nice if you adopt it on a on like the five thousand dollar level. But you know, on on in many ways, it's just considered a tax deductible donation. And what you have in many cases of the entities that tend to adopt um, emojis tend to be 
organizations that have something in common with it. So like, you know, like the, uh, an avocado trade association will adopt the avocado or the blueberry folks will adopt the blueberry. So we have found actually a great enthusiasm um, for emoji adoption among agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> that may, makes sense, but um, you know, like I think Ford adopted a car emoji. It's thing. It's generally things like that. It's it's kind of a nice. You know, for some of these large companies, five thousand dollars isn't that expensive, um, and it's a cute marketing gimmick that they can they can do, and so they'll find the the budget in their marketing, um, you know, spend to do that. What's your what's your favorite emoji? And did you use emojis before Unicode? You know, were you on the Nokia phone with the Slash, yeah. slash, slash arrow kind of, kind of so thing. I think my my personal favorite emoji has to be the dumpling emoji because it was the first emoji that I personally proposed and um you know just speaking as like someone who's Chinese American I've now impacted the like 2500 year history of the dumpling like I I you know <laughs> I affected the history a little little tiny bit and it is you're, you're at the like, cutting edge of the evolution the of, the, of dumpling representation yeah no totally I mean like I made, I, I know, and, it, and it, I've made dumplings representable. And so it's so, I love it actually when on Twitter or Facebook, people put dumplings in their username. So it's not just like, you know, your name Jennifer Lee, but there's like a little emoji at the end. And when that like emoji is a dumpling, that really speaks to me. Speaks you're to you're me having about. cultural impact, real cultural yeah, impact. Totally. Um, you know, to be honest, I actually didn't use emoji all that much. I didn't even know what they were for a long time until my friend texted me one day and was like, there's no dumpling emoji. Or Apple, so she said Apple had no dumpling emoji. And I was like, oh, that's kind of strange. You know, especially since emoji originally Japanese and dumplings are obviously Japanese. So from my perspective, I was like, there are dumplings all over the world. You know, there's, uh, you know, gyoza and pierogi and ravioli and empanada. It's like basically all cultures have something that's that's like a little bit of yummy goodness inside a carbohydrate shell. And yeah, it's such a universal and food. Yeah, and like emoji are so universal. So the fact there was no dumpling emoji told me the system was broken <laughs> and therefore I had to go fix it. Like I, I was like, I'm going to go get yeah. a dumpling emoji. There's something wrong with the universe. And so that's how I like started down the rabbit hole of both uh, the documentary and then uh, our emoji work. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got another uh, audience question. This will probably be our last, uh, maybe okay. one question after this. Are there any emojis that you can't adopt? Uh, is there a... No, I think there, I mean, you, um, as long as someone else hasn't been adopted it in a, in, you know, to the point where there's, they hit a quota, I think anything, not only can you adopt all emoji, you can adopt characters. So like you can adopt the capital letter A, you can, you know, or the Enye or like, you know, any Chinese character or Japanese Arab. It's, it's basically, it's, it's Unicode adopt the character. Of course, the things that people tend to be most excited about adopting are emoji. Um, but I think any, any character that Unicode has proposed is fair game. I think. I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so from your point of view, uh, in, in the documentary, uh, the, close to the coda, it was, mm -hmm. um, what now? We, what's the future of, of, of emoji? Is it going to be restricted or is it going to blow up? And how, how do we see that happening? Yeah, you know, a lot of that actually depends on what users do. In, in many ways, what happens with the emoji uh, you know, committee is is driven by these large, gi these ginormous companies. I mean, like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, like, oh, right? And they will respond to what they want, what their users want. It's key to uh, understand that emoji are, is literally text encoding, like the way that the poo emoji is sort of the same psychic space, like a capital R or a dollar sign or, or whatnot. But um, what we obviously have been seeing in many different dimensions is the idea that like people really like the idea of quote memoji or bitmoji where people like representing them themselves um you know with their glasses and their haircuts and and sending those images those tend to be stickers as a so they're actually just like you know like you know, uh jpegs or pings or gifs or whatever as opposed to um like text encoding and we're we are kind of curious about that because does that take the pressure off of um, emoji encoding in some way? There's another kind of interesting proposal that I don't I don't think is going to get passed, which is creating a system of encoding that depends on the numbering system inside Wikipedia, so that if you have a number inside Wikipedia, in theory, 
that number represents what you are like conceptually. So like Eiffel Tower, you go to Eiffel Tower and then it, 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 it basically grabs the number um, that Wikipedia uses to encode the Eiffel Tower. And then like we would transform that into an encoding and then people um, can send uh, that code and it's your system has to know that it's an Eiffel Tower. That's a little controversial. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's being discussed. That yeah, well, watch out! Watch out for the agents in the matrix. It sounds like we're all being digitally encoded somehow and represented. Hey, thank you so much, yeah, of uh, Jennifer Aitley, Jenny. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. We're we're really looking forward oh, to always. Uh, watching uh, the next session of the movie. And if you are a teacher, come and book for free on the school's site.